to my garden. I'm back. We're going to try to do some information about plants. We're going to talk about pathogens, not our favorite subject, but we're going to talk about pathogens and some cures and various and sundry things. So let's get started. I don't know how many of you were able to find the shooting star hydrangea at Kroger's. Uh, I think it was a couple, three weeks ago they had them. I walked in and saw that thing and just fell in love. Didn't know anything about it, didn't care. I just had to have it, which is a thing I kind of do. I like plants. Anyway, so for those that also got that shooting star hydrangea, I have to tell you it has some idiosyncrasies. It's not really for our zone six. I think it's a nine, zone nine, that it prefers. Uh, also, you need to repot it. I found mine was pot bound. They start them months ago, and in that small pot, the roots get all wound around in the pot. So loosen the roots carefully, don't break them if you can, and then put it in a bigger pot. I have a feeling I'm going to be repotting this thing several times. Uh, another thing I found out about it is that uh, you want to wet, let the dirt soil dry maybe that much before you water. And then when you water, water it thoroughly. Let the water run out of the bottom and it's thoroughly watered for you. You can put it out in the spring. Not our spring. We don't have spring yet. Uh, but it is a cool weather plant and it doesn't want hot sun. Hot sun will fry it. So it needs part shade. I would go morning sun, part shade. Uh, I'm going to put mine out in a container and plan on bringing it in come fall. Another thing we have to do is all those lovely flowers. They are so beautiful, white shooting stars. Just in love with them. When they start to fade and mine are starting to get brown around the edges, we're going to have to cut the flowers off. Understand these have been forced to bloom early. Um, so we're going to have to cut the flowers off. Whether it will rebloom, I really don't know. I hope so. Uh, it needs just regular uh, fertilizer, just a slow release fertilizer, and I think that will keep it happy. As I said, I plan on bringing it in the fall and overwinter it in the house and putting it out next spring. One of the things they said you could do if you plant it in the soil is to cover it with a blanket. I'm not sure about that. Um, because we're zone six, five and a half, six, um, our ground freezes. I don't think those roots could take that. Uh, besides, you have to go out every day and take the blanket off because if you left it on, they would fry under the blanket if the sun came out. So it's a little dicey plant, but it's so beautiful. I think it's more than worth the effort. Um, prune it uh, after this, the flowers are finished and dead head it any damaged branches uh, to thin out older growth. Uh, dead head, the, of course, the flowers to remove spent flowers. I think that pretty much takes care of it. You know how amaryllis are, are forced to bloom. We, we buy them at Christmas time because we're starved for flowers. Well, that's pretty much what this is. Not satisfied with buying that, I got a pericallis. I don't think I've had it before. So I had to check that her out too. And it's a small genus category of about 14 species of flowering plants in the family Astrachea, native to the Canary Islands and Madeira. Kind of gives you an idea that it's not going to make it through our winters, <laughs> but it's so pretty and it loves cool weather. Uh, you plant in part sun, a rich moist soil. Uh, you can plant it early when temperatures are cool. It can tolerate as low as 
35 degrees. So watch your temperatures at night. I'm staring at the night temperatures, praying they'll get up to 40, 45 every night before I put these things out. It's a heat sensitive plant and thrives in cool weather. Easy care, uh, terrific in containers, uh, grows eight to 12 inches. They can be purple, blue, pink, bicolored. Um, good companion to pansies and sweet alyssum. It's generally considered an annual. It's a, we call it tender perennial and it's deer resistant. Love those deer resistant plants. And it will attract butterflies and will stop blooming in the heat. Now, because I bought the bear callus, I also got some pansies. Big, big faced pansies are so pretty. Again, it is a cool weather plant. It's derived from violas. You know, the wildflowers, the little tiny blue wildflowers that grow everywhere, comes from Europe and Western Asia, and it's known there as heart ease. Interesting. Cool weather favorite, full sun, blooms spring, summer, fall, winter. I don't think it'll bloom in our winter, but still, they can be left out. I have planted mine in next to the house where it is not in the cold north wind and I've had them come back. Then I can pick them up and plant them in a container again. Uh, they will spread. You plant them 7 to 12 inches apart and they will spread 9 to 12 inches and grow 6 to 9 inches tall. Water regularly, general all-purpose fertilizer, deadhead, the flowers to prolong the, prolong the blooming and encourage more flowers. Pests and diseases, my unfavorite subject. They can get mildew, root rot, rust, slugs, snails, and good old aphids. We'll get back to how to control these a little later on in the show. They are an edible garden flower and have a mild minty taste. You can put them in a salad. You can just put them on a plate because they're so lovely. I would suggest trying egg white. Well, first of all, check the bottom to make sure you don't have any bugs on your flower. And I would suggest egg whites and some very fine sugar and you have a real treat there in that flower and it looks very beautiful too. Now we're going to talk about soil. You know, potassium is necessary for flowering and fruiting. Phosphorus aids good root development and nitrogen is necessary for promoting lush foliage. Calcium stabilizes soil structure. Now, I use eggshells. I don't go out and buy any calcium to add to my soil. Uh, all winter long, starting in the fall, well, actually starting as soon as spring is over and I've sprinkled them out in the, on the garden, I start saving my eggshells. Uh, the ones I peel from hard-boiled eggs, uh, particularly the ones that I, you know, have a, a fried egg, baked egg, whatever the thing, but rinse out, there's a little skin in there. Rinse that out let it dry, put it in a baggie, and accumulate as many as you can. Smash them all. And then come spring, just sow them in your garden. I never have enough. Anyway, one of the side effects of putting these eggshells out is I never have slugs and I never have snails. They would not like crawling across those eggshells very sharp edges. So it has a twofold for me. We need to talk about soil test kits. Now, while it's early spring, you need to know where your garden is at, how the soil is coming along, what it's lacking, what it's got too much of, all these interesting things. Now I have talked to many garden centers and in 
including uh, Bordines, uh, Clarkston and Rochester, uh, Home Depot, uh, Wojo's, I can't get a hold of, but I know they have them. All of these garden centers, even Ace Hardware on Baldwin, they have it too. Uh, but the thing I want to suggest is you use distilled water. Don't use tap water. You're going to put it in this little container. I'm going to turn it around very quickly. I'm not sure you're going to be able to see it, but it has colors running down the side for you to know. A handy dandy little water applicator, distilled water, and these little pills, which are also green and may not show up, that you add, and then it will tell you according to the color that comes on your container here, what you need. And discovered within the package, there is a paper here with hundreds of plants and their pH range, what their range needs to be or should be. So you get some kind of an idea of what you need to do. It's all here, very easy. This is not hard to do. The tests run $7.99 to $23. They're, um, the, the $7.99, these little tests here, you are going to check. It's 10 checks for pH, two checks, two times you can check for phosphorus, two times you can check for nitrogen, two times you can check the potassium. So you can do it at various times through your growing season. Uh, again, don't forget the distilled water. I think it's a marvelous idea to get to that. Now, my most unfavorite subject is plant rust. I have to say that I was not paying attention. Apparently, I brought something into my garden a few years ago that had the rust. I didn't recognize it, didn't pay any attention to it. The second year, I found it on some more plants, but it was little, it wasn't very big, and I didn't think too much of it. Last summer, it was devastating. I lost four pantacle hydrangeas, three shrub roses. I mean, all these plants had been in my garden for years. It pretty much kills the plant. I tore them out as much as it broke my heart. I tore them out before trying anything to fix it, to just get them out of my garden, get them away from the other plants so that it would stop the spreading. And it seemed to have helped. Um, Rust loves damp conditions, which means two things. You want your plants to have breathing room. Air can circulate between the plants. I'm guilty of overcrowding my plants. Uh, mildew will come from overcrowding your plants. You want to use, if possible, soaker hoses or drip hoses. You better believe I bought soaker hoses. We'll be putting them out if it ever warms up a little bit. Um, if you don't have that, and you don't want to go to soaker hoses or drip irrigation, and you're going to water overhead, do it early in the day so the plants have time to dry before nightfall. Um, There are uh, uh, rust-resistant resistant cultivars. You can check that on the tags that come with the plants. It's not fatal, but the plants will decline, and mine did. They were just all, I, I, I was just very unhappy. It's also a problem for roses. As I said, I lost several many of my uh, shrub roses. There are things you can buy online I'm sure at also at garden centers. There's a VHT rust converter. There's a rust killer, an OSPHO, O-S-P-H-O rust converter, and another rust converter. 
Uh, there is a rest store online that you could check these out. They're very, they're expensive. Uh, and you, you would use them early spring where there's no foliage is present. I like homeopathic, homemade solutions to problems in the garden. Um, the simplest homemade fungicide is simply two aspirins, you know? Take two aspirins, call me in the morning. Two aspirins per quart of plain water. Mix. A gallon would need uh, eight aspirins, 325 aspirins. You need a handheld sprayer. I have a bottle of uh, yay big and can spray with it. Used in early spring, thoroughly spray the foliage, including the undersides. Make sure no rain is forecast for a couple of days. You don't want the rain to undo what you've just tried to do. There's also a baking soda formula. Um, one ounce of horticulture oil, oil <laughs> that you can get at your garden stores, and up to four teaspoons baking soda to a gallon of water. Again, you're gonna spray in early spring to help prevent rust from invading the garden or to control the spread of rust. Be a little careful if you choose to go to the baking soda side because that's got salt in it. And even though our plants need a little bit of salt, uh, we don't want salt to build up in the soil. It causes the soil to crack. If you see your garden has all these cracks and when you water the, the, the soil bunches up, that means you've got an oversupply of salt. The remi remedy is lots of irrigation. So you would need to water, water, water so that the salt would soak down, down, down out of the soil. Um, there's sulfur available in liquid, uh, in a wettable powder or as a dust. Use as a preventative again in early spring before temps reach 80 degrees. <laughs> Around here, I don't think we're gonna see 80 till July, but we could get lucky. Check labels before mixing instructions. There is a lime sulfur compound, but it smells like rotten eggs. And I don't think you want your garden to smell like rotten eggs. Now my roses. Aphids and spider mites the bane of our lives. <laughs> You're gonna love this. <laughs> you can make a spray of one quart of buttermilk, two cups of wheat flour, and two and a half gallons of water. Shake, well, spray. I prefer insecticide soap which is one teaspoon of vegetable oil, one teaspoon of dishwater soap, dishwashing soap, or one and one cup of water, or three tablespoons of the soap to one gallon of water. Cover the leaves thoroughly, spray them, spray them, spray them underneath, top to bottom, and leave this on for a few hours and then rinse, go back, rinse thoroughly. Go back out with plain water and spray 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 and spray. I learned the hard way, forgot to go out and rinse one of my roses and it died. It just, it couldn't breathe. The oil and the soap had clogged the leaves and they couldn't breathe. So make sure you do rinse your roses very carefully afterwards. One of the great things about the vegetable oil, vegetable oil and dishwashing soap is it will also get rid of Japanese beetles. I hate those suckers. That being said, I found out they were introduced from Japan, hence the name, in 1916. In my own little world, I can't think of one reason anybody would bring those things here, but 
And we have kudzu, too. Somebody thought that was a good idea. So use the insecticide soap. That really will work. They will go away. I remember being at Michigan State University mm, a few summers ago, and they have this huge rose garden. Just must have been five rows, very, very long. And they were all eaten by Japanese beetles. You could hardly find the plants for the Japanese beetles clinging to it. Make you sick. If you're an intrepid gardener and you're willing, you can pick those stinkers up and throw them in a bucket of water and then take them away from your garden. I think I prefer the insecticide soap. I really don't want to be touching beetles. I know. They aren't going to hurt me, but still I don't want to do it. And they fly away. There's nothing for them to eat. They don't like the soap. They don't like the oil. They can't get through to the plant. Can't suck the sap out of the plant. It works well, trust me. Powdery mildew is a fungal disease. <laughs> I think you're going to like this one too. Steep 16 bags of chamomile tea in two quarts of water for about 20 minutes. Strain, put into your container, and spray your plants. The aspirin therapy above mentioned can also be used. Two teaspoons of baking soda to a half teaspoon of liquid soap or oil soap and two quarts of water and spray. Or one part milk, nine parts water is a homemade <clears throat> solution for powdery mildew. I will definitely be trying that in my garden this year. If your leaves turn yellow, but the veins stay green, it means that your plant is lacking iron. Use one cup of iron sulfate to a bushel of compost. For nitrogen deficient plants, try amending the soil with coffee grounds. See, this means I have to open up my little curate cups and pour out the coffee grounds. <laughs> I guess I'll have to. You do what you have to do. Now, one of the things that I got, and I don't have it here with me, I thought I did, is uh, it's reading a book. Always reading a book. And it talks about flowers and what the flowers mean. Back in Victoria times, long time ago, people would send flowers and you understood what the flowers meant so you knew what this bouquet was trying to say to you. Um, so I got, I have a few here. I thought we'd do a few each month just for the fun of it. Acanthus is artifice. Allium is prosperity. I planted allium in my garden this year. I hope it's going to prosper. Aloe is grief. Guess I won't be giving anybody an aloe plant. Alyssum, worth beyond beauty. And they are so lovely. Amaryllis, pride. That's our Christmas plant, my Christmas flower. Angelica, in, introspection. An aster is patience. I can't seem to grow asters in my garden, but when I do the test kit, I think that'll help me figure out what the soil needs to grow some asters. And azalea, the rhododendron, means fragile, Passion. Interesting. We're going to, I'm going to be doing this show every month. Uh, I'll talk about plants. I'll talk about hopefully topics that are right now. Uh, we'll go through spring, summer, and fall. You know, the plants for that season. 
I will have a online here. It's called EV, capital E, capital V is in Victor, capital G, Garden, E, V, G, Garden, Garden, 1G, Garden, at Orion, O N T V dot org. If you have questions, leave me a message. Uh, if you have a certain plant you want to know more about, I'll try to find out for you. Um, I would just plain like to hear from you. Let's do a test run and see how that goes. And we will come back and see you again next month. I'm Evelyn saying goodbye, and I hope your garden grows beautifully.